Welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, and wherever else the waves take us. This episode is brought to you by Workiva, the risk, reporting, and compliance platform that simplifies your complex work. So logging in to sign off on quarterly reports feels like riding a bike, not falling off of one. Check it out at workiva.com slash podcast. My name is Katherine Sai. I'm a writer by trade, a venti soy chai enthusiast, and I can figure out what to tip people without a calculator. I'm looking forward to debiting a great conversation today, and I'm happy to have you with us. I'm also happy to have Mike Gravano joining me. Mike, can you please tell the fine folks who you are? Sure. I'm a producer of Off the Books and a recovering cherry coke addict. And I love podcasting and learning new things, so I'm here to learn. Who are you and Steve talking to today, Catherine? Well, we're right in the thick of summer, so Steve and I figured it'd be a good time to talk to Kelly Davis, who's based out of Maryland. She is Director of Research for the Outdoor Industry Association, as well as the Cross Country Ski Areas Association. She has a deep background in market research, and during her career, she's worked closely with finance leaders, so we'll ask her about that. Oh, I thought you guys just wanted like the hot ski tips and trends in the outdoor industry. Okay, guilty. (laughs) Buckle up. Here's our conversation with Kelly Davis. Kelly, we're so glad you came by. Could you maybe give us a quick elevator speech of of your background? Sure. Uh, It's been a it's been a winding path. Um, I guess I you know I could say I started in manufacturing and went to intelligence after that and. and then, you know, ended up in New York City at a, at a startup.com back in 99 and 2000. And uh, then I made my way back to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where I decided that I wanted to, to work my passion. So I got the job as director of research for the Snow Sports Industries America, which is the trade association for snow sports, and did that for about 11 years. And left that to go be the senior research director for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. And uh, then the pandemic hit and um, the research director job for outdoor opened. And I thought, yeah, I think that sounds like a good place for me. So I'm back in outdoor. And I've been here since July. Awesome. Thanks. Well, I know we have at least one fan who would be my father who would be very excited to talk to you about your AOPA uh, experience. So I don't know how much we'll get into that, but... Sounds like you've had a lot of interesting experience and experience that we're anxious to talk about. Yeah, me too. Except for the one thing. And I can't tell you that or else I'll have to kill you. (laughs) (laughs) We'll try to avoid that. Maybe later. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) How does your work tie back to what's going on in the office of the CFO? Well, it's it's sort of interesting, you know, and, and speaking of AOPA, at AOPA, I worked for the CFO. So I was part of the finance group. And it was the first time that, that I've ever been in that position where research was part of finance. And so, you know, the, the financial analysts and the research analysts work together. And actually, it was, it was really interesting. And, and really, it's a, it's a distribution from, you know, internal data to external data. And, and we sat at both ends of that distribution. Research is about external. And the finance guys were about, about internal and business intelligence. So really, when you think about understanding what's going on within the company and how the company interacts with its its customer base or its member base of the the world is a complete distribution, including finance and research. And I really got to like working that way because, you know, the the financial analysts had basically the same skill set that the research analysts did. It was just a difference in where we were looking and where we were focusing. But having us work together help, helped us to really inform you know, everyone in the, in, in the organization about what was going on both in the world and, and how the company was reacting and how the world was reacting to the company. Did you spend a lot of time with, with the day-to-day accountant? It seems like there'd be a, a financial planning and analysis angle. Accounting, not as much. Um, They were part of the same team. So, you know, obviously we interacted, but it was more the financial analysis team. Um, Those are the those are the guys that were putting together the business intelligence dashboards 
that informed management of what was going on in the company every single minute of every single day. I mean, they were amazing. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, if you think about the typical role of, of FP&A uh, planning and analysis, it's, it's generally forward looking. And of course, the accountants are usually kind of backward looking, but you know, it always sort of starts out, I think, with that fundamental understanding of, hey, what is happening? What is going on in the business? Where do we expect it to go? That understanding, I think, can help inform maybe some of the more technical and subjective areas in accounting where you do have to rely on those future forward-looking assumptions. So the, the way we work together, and we, we spent a lot of time together because when they were formulating their analyses, they relied on research to tell them what was going on in the market so that they can include those variables in their equations. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about um, maybe some uh, historical trends, but uh, but then maybe how that informs you know the way things are headed in the future. You've got two outdoor enthusiasts. Uh, Catherine is a snowboarder. I'm a skier. You know, can you tell us a little bit about what the trends have looked like over the last two years, especially with that sort of explosion that we saw around COVID? You know, one minute the mountains were completely empty and then the next minute it's just like a complete madhouse. I mean, what did you see from your vantage point over the last couple of years? And and, and then maybe where do you think that means that things are going to be headed in the future? OK, um, well, you know, I, I do have participation data. So when I think about, you know, what happened, I know that there were about um, eight and a half million new hikers that entered the market. I also know that team sports slowed down. So, you know, kids that are playing baseball, soccer, lacrosse. You know, that that slowed down a bit. Anything that that required a team in 2020 slowed down a bit, and and is still working on picking back up. Outdoor activities like fishing, camping, hunting, um, hiking, walking for fitness, um, all of those did fairly well. Well, well, some of the even snow sports hurt a little bit in 2020, um, and you know, you're seeing skier visit numbers where that's a, we've got a lot to talk about in snow sports because they've had a paradigm shift in the market with the incentives for everybody to buy a season's pass. And we can talk about that, but all of a sudden it's, you know, you have to decide what to do when your options are pretty much limited to let's go outside. And so about, about 9 million more people got outside during the pandemic. Um, a lot of them are doing basic things, um, biking, hiking, camping, fishing, and walking outside. Um, and we saw that the most accessible activities are the ones that grew the most during the pandemic. And frankly, I got the 2021 data a few months ago and and I got the top line data and looked at it thinking, oh boy, you know, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see a major crash because you know the the whole expansion during the pandemic was just artificial and transient. And then I got the 2021 data and that didn't happen. It was actually sticky. There were there were 666,000 new hikers in 2021. So we actually grew more in 2021 in a number of different activities, especially those that were that were very accessible from the front door. So like major, no major inconvenience, no driving, none of that. You just basically could go out the door and do it. And those things were sticky. Um, now that we're we're hopefully getting to endemic, I think we're pretty close. I think everybody's kind of just living their lives again, and you know it's it'll be interesting to see what what the patterns look like in 2022. But I take I'm I'm going to take a lesson from what we saw in skier visits this year. You know, skier visits this year hit 61 million. That is the biggest season ever in history. So you know if if I'm looking at that and thinking, okay, you know. Maybe we extract the variable on season passes and, and just look at, you know, what is driving people to just be outside, especially in winter, especially, you know, when you're thinking about downhill skiing, there's a lot of inconvenience involved in that. I mean, talk about inconvenient things, all kinds of equipment that you've got to buy and take care of and haul around. I mean, if you've got kids, it's just a major exercise. And, you know, to show up and, and enjoy the experience when, you know, maybe you spent 30 minutes in a lift line or the first time you had to go up the mountain or it was really crowded or you didn't have that great of an experience. And yet you still went back. So I'm, I'm thinking about when I'm looking at the snow sports data from this season, I'm thinking about the entire outdoor market and what I'm seeing in the participant base, which is outdoor is sticky. People are people are not going back inside, they're, they're continuing their outdoor activity as the pandemic, you know, sort of reaches a, a stage 
and I hate to say it, we're not, I guess we're not in a pandemic or in a pandemic, but as we get out of this particular stage in our, in our history, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. And the data is beginning to indicate that outdoors is going to keep the people that, that decided to experience it during the pandemic. Well, is that a good thing or a bad thing that so many people are heading outdoors? It depends. I think there, there, we have problems right now with lack of dispersal of people. So there are some iconic spots that are getting really, really used and really, we'll say, overused. So um, I'm thinking about you know going to Yosemite and being in a giant crowd of people or having to get reservations to go into Glacier National Park or even going to your you know more popular local trailhead and you know the first mile basically is just a line of people. So we've been talking about that. We've been talking about about how we can disperse people across the environment. I mean, I did a, a funny analysis, just of something really simple to make a point that if we took the the basically it's about 56 million hikers and dispersed them over the national trail system, which is about 88,000 miles, that we'd have and everybody came out at once. You know, we could separate each other by eight feet. <laughs> Not bad, right? Oh, and, but talking about it, you know, within the industry, we've talked a lot about how we can use apps to try and help people find trails that are closer to home, you know, and encourage more use of, of more trails so that, you know, we can, we can manage some of the overuse problems we're having in a more iconic spots. Do you wonder... Do you wonder, though, that with flexible work and, and now increasingly people able to work wherever, I take that phenomenon and I combine that by what you said a moment ago, which is that um, this growth was the most pronounced in sports where you could just walk right out the front door. And so, you know, maybe I'm going to offend some of our listeners in West Texas here, but I'm thinking about, hey, if I live in West Texas and I like to hike, that's a much different thing, unless I love the desert, than it is here where I'm at in Salt Lake City, where... You know, I'm looking out my window and within 20 minutes, I mean, you can be on these world-class trails and certainly you can be from your front door. So what does that say about the compression then of those areas that are, you know, right in the heart of pristine outdoors and, and how we're going to manage that capacity? Because I know even just anecdotally myself going up on the mountain to go fly fishing, for example, it's nuts. I mean, like it is just absolutely crazy. It is a little nuts. I think I think the idea is, it, you know, we if we can figure out how to to educate people about all of the access they have to nature near their home, so that maybe we get them to mix it up a little bit, and maybe instead of, you know, we can we can convince people to do more than just maybe they started out hiking and they never thought that they would do that. So maybe we can get them camping and fishing and riding a bike. And get everybody spread out a little bit. I don't think anybody enjoys a situation where you go to a trail and there are a gazillion people there. I mean, you're you're trying to get away, right? You're trying to get into nature. And, you know, sometimes I've heard stories of, of etiquette issues or vandalism issues. Or there's a story going around in the industry right now about um, National Park Service is really tired of picking up poo. <laughs> so, I mean, it gets it, it actually gets into situations that are that are super gross and not good for nature. So we are talking a lot about how to disperse people um, across the environment and uh, talking about ways that we can do that that are more carrot than stick. You know, you never want to say to a new person that they're not welcome because of, you know, they, they violated this and this and this um, ethical code and they didn't even know that the code existed or they didn't, they didn't understand. So we have to do a good job of educating and then, Think of innovative ways to teach people about all of the access that they have and all of the fun things that they can do outdoors. And frankly, you know, outdoors, you know, it, 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 hiking is really just walking on dirt. So we might even be able to convince people to just, you know, do some urban hiking, which is basically just walking around in the city. I mean, just other, other ideas about how you can participate outdoors and get that same benefit that you get from walking on a trail and say, you know, Redwoods National Park, which is sort of, you know, what I, when I, I'm having a hard day, I close my eyes and think about, but you know, not everybody's going to hike the PCT. Nobody, nobody's, not everybody's going to be a through hiker on the AT. So, you know, we want to be innovative and, and frankly, you know, the new participants, the people that came into the market, you know, they didn't have preconceived notions about what hiking should be or what fishing should be. 
And we've seen some pretty interesting ways of people are, are getting out and participating without doing it in, a, in a, the way we normally thought of, but are just enjoying you know, maybe a quarter mile hike in with the family back and have a barbecue at the trailhead. And that's, that's hiking. That's still hiking. So you know, there are a lot of things that we've got to look at, and including you know, how we define participation. It also seems like with flexible work, there's some flexibility in when you can take part in some of these activities. I mean, anecdotally, <laughs> at the ski resorts, it definitely seems busier this year on weekdays than on weekends. And I'm wondering if the data backs that up. It definitely does. Um, and I've been looking at, at workforce issues a lot. And, you know, flexible workplaces have been such a benefit to outdoor so people are able to go out in the middle of the day during the week and recreate. You know, we're not spending two hours a day commuting. Um, it's, it's easy to do. And it definitely had an impact on outdoor. And, it, you know, think about snow sports. It really had an impact on snow sports. The resorts for years were trying to figure out how to get people to come midweek. And finally it happened. So we've got a lot of midweek participation. And by the way, one thing I left out in my background, I do... And on a pro bono basis, I am also the director of research for the Cross Country Ski Areas Association, um, as if I needed another job. But um, we, so we, we built a, a really nice balanced panel of cross country skiers, and about 80% of them said that they are not only are they are they skiing more during the week, m many of them are only skiing during the week. They're not skiing on the weekends because the, the weekends are are. The cross-country trails are getting more crowded because of refugees from the downhill experience. So a lot of people are saying, well, you know, it's it's not that great of an experience to ski downhill on weekends because of the crowds. Maybe I'll try cross-country skiing. So we're looking at that as, as sort of an example of what can happen, you know, across the industry in, in terms of people thinking about what other activities can I do during the week that might be interesting. So we are, we're looking at flexible workplace and just sort of keeping an eye on how people are, are going back to work and what, what that paradigm is going to look like in the future, because it's sort of up in the air right now. Keep in mind that there are many people that, that, you know, they have to work in person. But for those of us lucky enough, and I'm full of gratitude that I can do this, um, that can work from anywhere, it's, it's become, life has basically become kind of a blur where you can do all kinds of things during the week. And we're hoping that that trend continues. You know, outdoor stands behind, you know, freedom and flexible workplaces so that everybody can get outside during the week. And, and we spend less time in cars, you know, putting carbon into the atmosphere and just generally making ourselves miserable. So when I talk about dispersing people across the environment, we can disperse people in time, too. Right. So, you know, if, if people are participating across every day instead of everybody hitting everything on Saturday and Sunday, which still that's still going to be the dominant pattern that we're going to we're going to achieve some of our dispersion goals, as well as, you know, give people a better experience, in my opinion. I mean, maybe maybe people some people like being in a crowd outdoors. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> Well, it's it, so so. It's interesting the the way that you described it. So I'll I'll you know maybe full transparency here. So I have uh, I'm I'm an avid skier, and I have kind of two ski lives, if you want to call it. I have my maybe a little more aggressive skiing with there's a colleague that I work with, or maybe my my older sons are quite good at skiing, and so we'll we've actually decided, hey, if we're gonna do this, we have to do it during the weekday. Uh, we can actually carve out the time you sort of like maybe, you know, on your calendar, like you put a fake block, like I'm recording an episode of the podcast, but without Catherine. So nobody's bugging <laughs> me. Right. And I'm going to, you know, and, and then we're going to go ski. But then I have my second life, which is uh, with my wife and, and my kids. And, you know, we used to go Saturday mornings. Well, that's just a train wreck. So now it's just on Saturday afternoons. And it's so interesting that I realized we've carved out those times to try to avoid the crowds to have the least amount of inconvenience as possible. And clearly I'm not the only one thinking about this. In, in cross country, if I, I'm going to, and I'm going to pull the stat off the top of my head. Um, this is my survey, so I should know it, but about 53% said of, of our, of the market, because we have a, a sample that we can project um, said that they were, they're more likely to ski on weekdays and weekends. And, I, you know, some, I, when I did a little bit of analysis on that, I found out that a lot of those were more core skiers, 
Um, but there are plenty of casual skiers, cross country skiers that said that had a downhill pass, by the way, that said, no, I'm weekends. I'm cross country skiing. Cause it's nuts at the, at lift served. It's crazy up there. I'm not doing it. So that's that, you know, I have a little bit of data and a few anecdotal stories, but it does, you know, we do have some evidence that, you know, the flexible work environment is going to, is going to breed a, a new pattern in when people participate and how often they participate. So it yeah, we favors the welcome. season pass users, I would think, where you can kind of decide last minute, I'm going to go to the mountain or I'm not going to go to the mountain today and yeah. maybe only spend half a day there. I don't know, Catherine. I think the, the, the industry is just point blank incentivizing season pass. So you can buy an Epic Pass or an, an Icon Pass. And let's say, okay, you're going to spend 800 bucks on that. And um, at that point, you're committed. I mean, that's great. It's great for the for the business because you know then they don't have to to rely on good snowfall for you know their revenue. But you know when you when you consider that in in at many resorts, many Vail resorts, many Icon resorts, you know the walk up price is is well north of 100 bucks at many Iconic resorts. It's well north of 200 bucks. Yeah. So, I mean, you're absolutely incentivized to have the pass. And I, and I think it's, you know, when I think about doing some regression on what's, what's impacting snow sports behavior in particular, season pass would be a very important variable. So Kelly, tell me what I'm doing wrong here with the season pass. And, and, and I ask that question because I loathe the fact that I have already purchased my icon pass a month ago and, and I did a fair bit of analysis, right? I looked at the window price of Alta. I looked at how many days that I would get on my Icon Pass at Alta because I think we're going to do go-cards for my wife and for the kids because we just we just haven't seemed to use it enough to justify a pass. But meanwhile, me and my oldest son have got the Icon Pass because we plan to do a bunch of skiing. And, and I'm actually irritated and upset the fact that I'm having to make this decision in March and April Right for a season that's not even going to start for you know like six months. I mean that is crazy to me. How what, what what am I doing wrong? Or maybe what importantly, more importantly, what is the industry getting wrong? Or I guess trying to get right because I'm not happy about it. To be totally honest with you, it's not a great experience. I feel like for me, um, you know, as a season pass holder. Yeah, and I, I haven't done I haven't done much research on the experience of buying a pass. You and I, Catherine, do you have a pass? <laughs> we can make ourselves. I do. A group. I'm a, I have an Epic Pass. I have to have an Epic Pass because Vail owns the three resorts closest to me. Um, you're not doing anything wrong, Steve. You're not doing anything wrong. Um, this is this is a way for the these you know these resort companies, um, Vail's publicly traded, uh, to basically transfer risk onto the consumer. So you should be a little bit pissed off because when you once you spend the money on the pass. All the risk falls on you. And yes, you can buy pass insurance in cases of a really bad season or, you know, pandemic hits and they have to close down the season. You can't ski or maybe you get injured. That's a different kind of insurance. But they're transferring all the risk of, of a bad snow year right onto the consumer. So from a business standpoint, it's really smart. And it's worked, frankly. And it also has had the benefit of, of selling passes to people who are now going to be committed participants. I mean, you can go a season and think, yeah, you know, I want to get up there a couple times and just pay the, maybe it's a hundred bucks. You, I'm going to buy a hundred dollar lift ticket and I'd have to go eight times to pay for a pass. Right. And so, you, but the snow just doesn't fall or the conditions are crappy or there's a traffic jam on I-70 or, you know, whatever might happen and you decide, screw it, I'm going to go do something else. If you have a pass, maybe you're going to do that, but you're definitely going to get up to try and make the, you know, try and get the value out of that $800 pass. So, you know, I think once people buy a pass, the the benefit is they become a committed participant. They're probably going to buy skis or a snowboard. You know, they're probably going to make plans since, you know, you're, now the passes are multi-resort and Vail is now, you know, expanding into Europe. And you think, well, I've got this pass, so... I can go to my this resort that's maybe not as as fancy, and then you know I'm going to show up at 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 Breck or Beaver or Park City, and I'm just I'm going to I'm going to use this pass. So what you're getting from that is you know a dual benefit to the industry, which is basically more people skiing more often, 
uh, and they're doing it in a way that's that's committed, which means they're yeah, buying all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you're talking extra flights, hotels, meals, yeah. maybe a lesson or two. Yeah, and I mean it's so I don't, Steve, I don't know you. I think you, the mistake you make is living in an iconic ski area. <laughs> you're lucky. You, right. I need to move to West Texas. Then this wouldn't exactly. be a problem. Exactly. <laughs> move over here. Um, so you know, I gravity works the same everywhere I've ever I've ever been. So even if my hill is small, only 660 vertical, um, I can lap it like crazy. But then I'm, you know, every time I'm on the lifts, people are like, so where are you going out west? I can't wait to ski out west. I need some powder days. I need this. I need that. And it's the cool thing too. I don't know how. I mean. Vale's Consumer Insights Department, and I know them, are very, very good. And somehow, you know, they're driving discourse on the lift that leads to what iconic resort are you going to go to and brag about this year? You know, my solitude has always been my backup just if I need to brag to somebody. Like, yeah, man, I'm going to solitude. I got a big plan there. (laughs) Just so I can have something cool to say. But yeah. I think the mistake we made is not having this conversation on a ski lift. That's a you know what? 100%, Catherine. 100%. While Steve and Catherine marinate in their mistakes, we'll take a quick commercial break. Dear listener, I thought we should get to know each other a bit better. My first job was working for Uncle Randy's carpet cleaning service when I was 14. Every other day, I'd meet Uncle Randy in the parking lot of a local taco eatery and collect hundreds of flyers. Then I'd spin up my disc man and spend a few hours rollerblading door to door, hanging said flyers, announcing Uncle Randy's carpet cleaning prowess. Once a week, we'd meet up in the aforementioned local taco eatery parking lot, and I'd get paid for my hard work of blading and flyering. Weird vibes aside, there's a lot wrong with the way Randy and I worked. How did he know this teenage punk wasn't just tossing the flyers in a dumpster and skating all around town? How did he know I'd hit the assigned routes? How did my parents let me meet a grown man who called himself Uncle Randy in a parking lot to be paid under the table? Well, with the Workiva platform, you never have to worry about who's handling their job. Whether you're working on a document, presentation, or spreadsheet, you'll always know who updated what and when. Collect, manage, and report data with complete audit trails, data lineage, and transparency. Don't be an inefficient Uncle Randy. Use Workiva. Learn more at wakiva.com slash podcast. That's W-O-R-K-I-V-A dot com slash podcast. Let's send it back to Steve, Catherine, and Kelly Davis of the Outdoor Industry Association. We're talking how season passes have helped ski resorts lock in revenue. In the season pass world, I, you know, one of the things I'm worried about is it's very, very expensive for somebody to learn how to ski now. So 18 year old Kelly and Mammoth, um, and I'm just gonna say yada, yada years ago, paying $35 for a lift ticket, okay, that's cool. That's, that's, it took me about three days to really get the hang of it. And that's kind of what it takes. I mean, we did a lot of research at Snow Sports to try and figure out, you know, what the optimal amount of time was from beginner to to a committed skier, and really it, it took about three lessons and a couple of a couple of visits after that solo before we could really count on somebody to to start thinking about buying equipment and buying all of the things that you need to be comfortable and and ski well or snowboard well. And you know I'm thinking, okay, so you're buying a walk up ticket for 220 bucks and a let you know basically a day is going to cost you about 700 bucks. So make it 2100 bucks. And that's not even including if you're staying somewhere, lodging, or any of any of the, you know, the other things that you might have to buy or pay for um, as you learn how to ski. But it's going to cost you probably three thousand, four thousand bucks to really learn how to ski or snowboard. And that's 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 a pretty big barrier to entry. Um, and it, you know, you can do it maybe if you're lucky enough to have to be a kid whose parents can pay for ski school and have the passes, and that's all good. But unless you're unless you're coming in um, to to snow sports with that you know with that support that traditional support the family skis or snowboards that's one of the things we do together. If you're just thinking maybe I'll learn how to do this, it's going to be much much harder for those for that group of beginners 
to really get on the slopes and, and learn. So I'm wor a little bit worried about the participant base in snow sports because it's, it's getting less accessible you know, every year. It is encouraging to see some of the efforts they're doing around like free urban skate parks, ski hills, um, but definitely more of that is needed, I think. Definitely. But I mean, it runs the gamut too. And, and thinking not just of snow sports, but thinking about what attracts people to an area. And I've spent a lot of time talking to economic developers about this, that, you know, having, having good um, built environment that encourages outdoor activity is really key you know, to building your economic base. And one example of that, everybody's talking about this town right now, and yes, it's the headquarters of Walmart, but man, you know, they have built an amazing infrastructure of mountain bike trails all around their town. And it's, it's drawing a lot of attention, and it's, it's, it's not just the bike world that's paying attention either. So there are all kinds of ways to encourage participation um, in a way that isn't necessarily full of barriers. Well, maybe we can send them all to Bentonville instead of Salt Lake City because it's getting real crowded out here. <laughs> well, think about think about the it's outdoor paradise, Steve. You know, I did, I I spent about a year in Park City, and I mean, from a from the standpoint of availability of outdoor, and I'm talking about four seasons. My goodness, you're lucky, really. Oh yeah, it's unparalleled. I mean, I mean, I, I used to work in Park City at a, at a previous job. Um, boy, if you wanted to hike over lunch, easy peasy. If you wanted to grab, you know, a few turns on the mountain, a few laps uh, before you started your day, great. I yep. did it all the time. Um, I mean, just the accessibility is just unheard yeah. of. Fortunately, you know, I can't afford a garden shed in Park City. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. a good point. That's a good point. You 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 can live down here with the common folks like me and uh, the yeah. Saturday I like family. living with the uh, you know with the plebes in Frederick, Maryland, <laughs> where <laughs> where we also have an amazing amount of outdoor and green space. Um, we have a basically a, a stretch of, of DNR Department of Natural Resource Lands that that runs from about five miles from where I'm sitting now, about thirty miles north to Camp David. And it's, it's, a, it's a very, very large stretch of woods, and that is my playground. I, I love it. And gravity works the same way there. And we've got some world-class downhill trails, maybe for mountain bike. For ski, that yeah. Sounds, you know, that sounds great. I got to hang out at my little local resort, Liberty, where, you know, I, I, did, I did the snow reporter job for about three, four years up there, just so I basically so they'd give me a place to work. <laughs> it was a good train. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. So like you were there like, okay, hey, yeah, we've got five inches overnight. Uh, you know, it's going to be powder, packed powder through the day. Might get some flakes later in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. I mean, is that... and it was, you know, it's going to be a sunny day, bluebird day. Don't forget your sunshine goggles. Don't leave those at home. You're going to need those. Okay. It was such a fun job other than having to get up at the break of, you know, middle of the night and go do it. And yeah. plus I got first tracks. I mean, first, first tracks, not, I mean, like real first tracks. It was awesome. Excellent. And Excellent. a cubicle with a printer and minimum weight. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of fun, we should probably get to our closing question of the day. Oh, Are you right. ready for this, Kelly? No. <laughs> <laughs> our closing question of the day. So we've been wanting to talk to you for a while. And at the time, I think the Winter Olympics were on. So if you could win a gold medal in anything, what would give you your best shot at a gold medal? Right now, archery. <laughs> archery? I'm too old for anything else, Catherine. <laughs> no way. <laughs> way, way. You know, back back when I was when I was young, um, I dreamed dreamed of downhill. I right? just go fast, and you know, I've got the risk taking gene. My dad was a Navy fighter pilot, for real. So yeah, I you know, I've got a need for speed. I still ride that. I've told you about my, my Elon board that goes 35 miles an hour that I still ride. And people look and they're like, Grandma, <laughs> what are you doing on that skateboard? But yeah, um, right now, if I really, really, really felt that I needed to compete in the Olympics, my best shot is probably archery. Yeah. Excellent. You're always on target, so I can see why that would be your answer. So <laughs> I actually love it. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. An e-longboard, 35 miles an hour archery. You're like the most interesting person we've ever talked to. <laughs> you know, to. someday I'm going to take the bow out on the longboard. 
<laughs> I just, I love when, you know, and, and I think people are getting to know, you know, that I'm, that I am maybe a little bit crazy, the crazy old lady in my hometown, but it's hilarious to basically pass people in cars on that thing and have them look at me. And I could see in their face, like, you are not who I expected to see on that. <laughs> So yeah, you can take the you can take the girl out of California, Steve. Can't take the California out of the girl. No kidding. Oh, I'm also a pilot, but I'll just I'll leave that for another day when we talk about AOPA. Oh man, another day, another episode. That's what I'm thinking. I'm here for you. Absolutely. So, Catherine, you asked the question, but I'll actually ask you the same question. What would your uh, what would your gold medal be? It would be in. Oxford comma placement. I know where they go. I know where they shouldn't go. I can win a gold medal in that. <laughs> I'm willing to die on the Oxford comment, uh, comment <laughs> as well. So a gold medal though, you, I, yeah, maybe I'd take bronze. <laughs> Steve, do you have an answer? Well, I, I liked your answer because then that makes my answer seem so much less lame than it really is. I'm pretty good at doing the dishes. You know, the other day I was sitting at the, as I was sitting at the sink, I was like, man, you know what? Like, this is efficient. I am getting stuff in and out of this. The kitchen is looking good. I've got, I'm a well-oiled machine. And I actually thought to myself, what if there was a, like an Iron Chef show, but instead of cooking, what about the competition of the cleaning, right? Who's cleaning up the fastest? Could that be entertaining? I have no idea. That but anyway, I'm feeling pretty hot to trot about my dish doing I, ability. I like that point. idea. You know, it's not beat Bobby Flay anymore. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, it, it, it makes me feel good to hear you say that, since I am certainly not going to be uh, winning any archery competitions whilst on a 35-mile-an-hour E-long Hey, man, if I'm the only person that does it, I'm the best. <laughs> <laughs> you win Woo! by default. I love it. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of boring mathematicians out there. I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. How did we do, Mike? Oh, I thought it was great. I, I learned so much more than I expected. As, as not an avid skier, I was like, I don't really care. And then Kelly had so much to share. So it was, <laughs> it was awesome. So yeah, thank you for you guys having a great show. Big thanks to Kelly Davis of Outdoor Industry Association for joining us today. And big thanks to you, dear listener, for surfing along with us. I'm Catherine Sai. You just heard from Steve Soder and me. This has been Off the Books presented by Workiva. Please subscribe, leave a podcast review, Tell your buddies if you liked the show and feel free to drop us a line at offthebooks at workiva.com. Surf's up and we'll see you on the next wave.